Good evening and welcome to the shop once again here in beautiful Canterbury. Rainy and wet, but a great shop night. So I'm glad you stopped by. Just make yourself comfortable. We're going to make something. What we're going to make tonight is, well, you've, if you've been around or hanging around the shop any number of times, you know I like to make these little scale drawings of projects. And I know some of you have been really jealous of my, my <laughs> board. Some of you have said, where'd you get that board? Well, I couldn't remember where I got it, but it was pretty handy. Had some nice wires on it, went up and down. <laughs> but I have epoxied this end like two or three times, and I'm done with it, all right? So I said, that last time I broke it was just a couple days ago. I said, I said, that's it. I'm going to make a new board. Now, I alluded to this in an earlier episode, the hip to be square episode. But we're going to do it tonight. So tonight, I'm going to show you how to make your own little personal drawing board. Now, before we get started, I'm Tom McLaughlin, and this is Epic Woodworking. We're together in the shop. We get to the heart of woodworking with the camera lady doing her thing hello. she's did you say hello i did hello. oh i didn't hear it i was talking i guess but anyway if you like this content please subscribe and share and ring the bell and tell all your friends <laughs> is a that lot a of them are already on here this is great <laughs> i know we've got a lot of friends a lot of friends Friendships are happening on here, which has really blown our minds. We love it. People from all over. So we're really glad that you stopped in tonight. But I want to make this drawing board. This could change your whole approach to woodworking. <laughs> all right? It, seriously, it can. Because if you like to sketch occasionally, like a, an idea you have in your head, and you get it kind of sketched out, what I normally do is, is get the feel of a form of some kind of, if it's a chair or a, uh, a chest or a table base or something, I'll be sketching it out and then, but the sketch is never in proportion. So before I can start actually cutting wood to the actual shapes that are going to fit, uh, say a table, uh, let's say I wanted to make a trestle table and I want to make the ends and I wanted it to be 30 inches high. I would sketch that just free, but it wouldn't be to scale. So what I like to do is to take a drawing board. What I used to do <laughs> is take a drawing board like this. It's and been a faithful friend. Really. It is. It, we've been through a lot together, so I shouldn't have been so mean earlier. <laughs> we have. We've, yep. Look at. I even glued this thing on. It's. A, the, I don't know what you call this. What is this called? Some of you drafting guys, the slide bar or the whatever, it just slides and it used to stay horizontal until I broke it off. But even one time I glued it on and I put it on upside down. So we've been through a lot together. But when I take my sketches, I want to get them to scale before I can start even thinking about cutting wood or going out and buying wood. So I would just use this on a piece of regular 8.5 by 11 paper, put it on there, and I would select some scale on my uh, rule, my drafting ruler, and I'll show you that in a little bit, and just scale it to the size that would fit into my, on my paper. And then I would just take those shapes that I sketched and force them into the fixed dimensions that I have to work with. I mean fixed because your dining table pretty much has to land at about 30 inches high. So your base that you scratched out, your shape, is going to be 30 high underneath that table. And then however wide your table is, you want that base to sweep out and s enough to support, not look too small or too wide. So I'd actually sketch the width of the table I'd get the 30 inches height. And then once I had kind of 
the top end drawn, then I could look at my sketches and come in and actually, to scale, like start tracing out the shapes on my drawing table and refine it and get it really locked in. And we've done that a number of times. I've always shown you the finished thing, but we did that um, on the shop stool. Um, what else have we done on? Some the chairs. lily pad? Yeah, the lily pad the table. Whole process. For sure. Yeah, we did a whole thing. So. That's the series, second series you did. You can see that on our, our yeah. YouTube channel. So that helps a lot, that, that sketch. And it goes into a folder, but a lot of times before I'll even commit that, those shapes to a full size drawing, I'll do a mock up or a model even from our sketch. So a lot of good can happen. And like the ideas that you have, like think of a sketch as a rough draft. This is like your first draft, like your, your second draft, then your mock-up, your, um, uh, what else, your full-size drawings, that's the third draft, you know, and then you're cutting wood. So anyway, all of that kind of stepping into it leads to good design. So I'm thinking the same way about this drawing board. I want this drawing board to be good design. And that night when we were talking about the hip to be square, I showed you this cool little T-square that Pug had given me out of his collection of antique things. <laughs> and this is like almost folk art, you know. It's not actually square. There's a little bit of a wank to the, the beam on this now. And is that right? The blade, the beam. Oh, no. I forgot what they are again. <laughs> what is Don't it? look at me. It's, it's, <laughs> Is this the blade? Someone please remember. And this is the beam. Uh, anyway, it's like a hammer, the head and the handle. <laughs> yeah. The, anyway, this is not accurate. But we did make some pretty cool, accurate uh, squares out of wood inspired by this T-square. And if you want to see that, check out that hip to be square video. It's pretty fun. And we talked a lot about some this wood here let's see this material that night and this is old growth southern yellow pine also called heart pine and really nice wood uh, it always reminds me of my times in north carolina because we use this a lot for secondary wood on like say a chest of drawers your interior is never the primary expensive wood. Like the outside might be cherry, walnut, mahogany, but the interior, the drawer sides, the back, the drawer bottoms, they were always kind of usually a native, um, a native softwood that was fairly inexpensive to do the job. So the secondary wood in North Carolina in that region of the Southeast was very often Southern yellow pine. And up here, it's more like white pine or poplar. So this is a great wood, and it's very stable when you get it in this condition, where you've got the growth rings are perpendicular to the surface here. So you've got a very linear figure here. This is quarter sawn wood. It's very stable. And I intentionally um, saved this out of some floorboards to... Uh, use for just this moment. <laughs> so I'm glad you hung out. I've actually been saving this, as I said, for probably 35 years. Right? And before that, the house was 100 years old. So it's a long time. But um, so what I want to do is build a square like that horizontal guide we had on that other one that was guided by the wires underneath. And they call it a parallel bar. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to make my parallel bar <laughs> out, of, uh, out of wood and in this, in this manner. So I'm going to have an end or a, a beam 
or beam? It's a blade. <laughs> blade, beam. I'm going to have the beam on this end. Now that's your typical T-square. But in order to get this to travel nicely without having to hold it every time, I'm going to put a second beam on this end so that it'll be set just right so it'll just glide and stay horizontal. What do they call it again? Sorry, horizontal beam? Parallel bar. Parallel bar. <laughs> I should know that. Just think. Now, I, I could be wrong. They may, maybe they're calling those two side things the parallel bars. Guys, can you help? Anyway. No, no I think that, that parallel would be the parallel bar on the, on the drafting table. That makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense because it's parallel. It stays parallel to the horizontal line all the time. And you work off that. But anyway, so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to use the same kind of material that very similar to what we did the night of making the squares, except I have glued on these little edge strips. So to make this, I've got a nice piece of quarter sawn or riff sawn um, heart pine there. And I didn't want, given I was going to be drawing a lot on this edge, I wanted this edge to hold up and be really nice and hard and smooth for a long time. So even though the yellow pine is pretty hard, it's not as hard as hard maple. So that's what I uh, glued on to each side. Now, to make this, I didn't make just one this thick. I started with a piece about that thick. So I've got my material, and then I took, I ripped some strips of maple, also quarter sawn this way, and popped them on each side. And I just put some glue in there and threw a few clamps on there. So these are almost three-eighths of it. These are about three-eighths of an inch wide right now. After I was done, I jointed them and ripped them. And they ended up getting a little narrower. These are probably landed only about a quarter inch thick at the end because you wanted. But before I jointed them like that, I glued this thing up like a sandwich. So I've got it like this. And then after it was set, I jointed one face and then went to the, I went to the um, bandsaw and I just cut it into, say, maybe three cuts. Okay, not very even, but I did do even cuts. And that gave me three of these. So... What I like about that is not only is it very stable, but it gave a little more of a decorative edge. And I think having that lamination glue up also adds to the likelihood that it's going to stay true for a longer period of time than just being the natural um, cortisone heart pine like that. Let's, let's clear up some terms because I didn't repeat them too well. Um. So the rule is called a blade. You have a horizontal bead and a vertical blade. Maybe he meant beam, but he wrote bead. Maybe that's what it is. Beam. This must be the horizontal beam. bead and a vertical blade. So thanks for clearing that up. I'm sorry. Do we? <laughs> where are we now? Oh my gosh, you guys need a you know it's proper okay. expert on this side of the camera. Help no me. worries. We're gonna call this the blade and this the beam. Although this seems like a beam. <laughs> Doesn't matter. What I'm going to do is have the uh, parallel bar is going to have one of these shaped heads on each end. <laughs> so Parts A and B. Yeah. So I'm actually going to use this for the blade to be on my table. Now, I made this little top the exact same size as my Old Faithful. Kind of a tribute. So... I made it 18 by 24. So if you want to follow along at home on your own time, that's what I'm going to do. And when I, one of the things that's important is I, I did rip these, then I squared one edge on my handy crosscut sled that's dead on. 
Then I took the crosscut sled off the table saw and I turned it so I rode this nice square edge against the fence and carefully cut through because I wanted just to be absolutely sure these two sides are parallel. I trust my dead on sled, but you know, it's just good practice to do that. So then I've got two parallel sides because I'm going to sandwich this top between these two heads and I want it to slide really smooth, smoothly and not want to rack while we're going or not get stuck at one end and be loose at another. So that's pretty key when you make your board if you're going to do that. All right, so let's, oh, let's keep this for a second. I'm going to set this aside. And we're going to have this. Oh, I meant to say, you know, you don't have to do this funky sandwich thing. That was just what I had. I just thought I would do that. You could just grab a piece of hard maple itself and check this out. This maple, can you get into close on this? Mm -hmm. See that the grain on here? It's going just out like that. So it's nearly dead quartered. So this is a really nice piece of quarter sawn maple. It's a healthy, it's an inch and a quarter, probably start out six quarter. I jointed one face. And now let's just for fun, let's let me just show you how I resaw that. I did I do this the same way, whether it was a stack like this, this would be glued up to create this guy. Or simplify it. You don't have to glue it up. If you have some cool stock that's hard, it will be a good straight edge um, for your table. Just go ahead and use that. So let's kick this on and I'm going to make a cut putting my jointed face right against the fence right here. Here we go. All right, that was fun, huh, those sparks? Well, <laughs> those came out because I had just changed that blade and I set the, uh, there's like a ceramic, instead of, instead of that thrust bearing behind there, it's a, it's a disc uh, that's just ceramic. So it just got to get worn in a touch and then it stopped sparking. So it's funny, whenever you resaw a piece like this, the outer pieces are going to probably bow a little bit on you, just like this one did. See that? This, this has a little bit of a bow this way. So that's why you want to resaw them thicker than you want to land on at the end. Because I still got the bandsaw marks, and I'm going to have to plane those off. But if I go thicker, like an eighth inch thicker on something like this, I'll be pretty reassured. I can let it chill out, maybe overnight or whatever, then re-flatten and then run it through the planer and I'll have a flatter piece. What's interesting though is the inner pieces of your resaw, those that are freshly sawn on both sides, will almost always stay dead straight because you haven't changed the uh, the moisture content is the same on both sides of that piece, where these pieces out here, the moisture content out on this side may be different than what's on the inside. And plus you have already cut fibers here, where the inside just gets cut on both sides. There's something about it. It just stays in equilibrium better than the outers. But So you should allow yourself extra. And don't try to get too many out of this. Like it'd be crazy to try to get four. I would probably have set it into equal thirds and just gotten three out of this one and dressed this down to the end. But look at that. You have this really nice quarter sawn grain and it stayed true 
on the outside. So you could just rip some nice quarter saw material and get yourself a trusty uh, blade. <laughs> right? There's a myriad of things to call them. So. Okay, good. Well, we're going to go with blade, and this will be our beam. Okay, so I like this little reverse curve, also often called an OG curve. It always feels weird saying that. It's spelled O-G-E-E, -E. so OG, hmm. that's a nice curve. I have no idea where they came from. <laughs> Maybe we have some historians who can chime in. What is the root of the word OG? And um, let me see. Sorry, I'm gonna, gonna feel sneeze. like I'm gonna see. Let me turn you down here. <laughs> All right, I guess not. Oh, gee. No, just kidding. All right, so. What I did was I made, I like this shape, and I actually went a little bit longer. Just felt like I wanted a little more length, and I was holding it up to the, to the board. And just want to make sure it doesn't twist, and I got a nice tracking as, the, as it's the parallel bar slides up and down. So what did I go with here? I just went with... Um, it's eight and five eighths. So I got my stock, which is thinner, a little thinner than my three quarter inch MDF. And I'm going to set my little template on here. Now this template, I allowed this flat to be wide enough so that like half the distance, you just want that flat to be a little wider than your blade that you prep first. And then the width of this is about two inches. So all you have to do once you get it all set, let me find a good edge here. This is kind of a, not the best, but it'll do. Um, I'm just going to come down here. And so I'll hold it flush to this edge. And... Maybe this pen will work. Ron's asking if it was once called an O-G-I-V-E curve. O -G -I -V -E. I've never <laughs> seen that. Hmm. I've never seen it. But uh, it's, a, it's a classic uh, 18th century. <laughs> All right, so there you go. And then I'm going to make a little tick mark down here. This is to show the length. That's my center line. So now I'll just flip. And I only have to cut the profile on one end so that I know I'm going to get the exact same match. Because if you try to cut these shapes on both ends, just, you know, eyeballing it, they would be a little different. This way, you're tracing the same form on each end. And you get a beautiful symmetry there. So I would probably take the next one and place it this way if I had some... You know, you could alternate them like that. If it was a little over half, you can almost nest them together if this was a little wider. But um, I'm just going to do one for right now. And I just want to show you the process here. Let's go ahead and cut that out on the little bandsaw right over here. This is the bandsaw we tuned up last week. So it's good and sharp. Everything's adjusted well. We're ready to go.
All right. Pretty sweet. It's got the throwback to the original design. And I love it. It's got a nice kind of look to it. So to clean this up, there's a lot of ways to go about it. But something like this, I'm not going to use hand tools much. You know, it's not worth it. But it's great to have one of these wide belt um, sanders like this. They're six inches wide. It's just a big, um, you end up with the, the disc and the flat belt. This is an oldie, but a goodie. So I'm going to just... The profile is a little too small to get the round end here. If I try to get it there, I'm going to make my flat too small. So I'm just going to hit it, hit these ends first, and then I'll take care of this over at the bench. Here we go. That's pretty good. All right, so that's pretty good. That's nice and smooth. And now I'm going to go back over to the bench. Tom, before you go any further, is anything you would add as a technique on the bandsaw process you just went through? Any? Um, yeah, I mean, you could see where it was. That radius was just a little tight for that 3 8 inch blade. So I had to, I, as I was going in, I could hear it kind of starting to bind. So I backed up and I just cut the kerf a little bit wider where the back of the blade had to turn to make that tighter kerf. So that's all I did. And then at the end, I ran it out. I didn't try to get the tight kerf. And then I came back and just skinned that tighter element. But, um, but you can make preliminary cuts this way, relief cuts, so that you can get around there. But um, I had actually done this earlier and didn't experience any of that binding, so it's kind of weird. Um, maybe I used a little different technique. Um, but it didn't bind much. It's, it's important to keep moving, but I was definitely maxing out the uh, radius that blade can cut. All right, so I want to clean up the roughness here. And... I like using, just using a, <clears throat> a little sanding drum in the drill. So, and I'm kind of going downhill. I don't, I'm trying to avoid it going up and over there, but we'll see. That's some hard grain. This is a pretty coarse paper. It's getting clogged with the resins, but that's okay. So I'm just trying to get rid of that last little bandsaw. think of that. I always think of that. I know. I was thinking of myself. I know. I should have. Every time I say that, I think of that movie where the, it was Charlotte's Web. No, it wasn't Charlotte's Web. With the pig. And the guy, pig. Yes, the guy trains the pig. Mm -hmm. The pig's amazingly brilliant. He goes out and he does like so. the guy, And the farmer goes, that'll do pig. <laughs> <laughs> so, you told that joke like I tell jokes. I was going to say, I'll do pig. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Did you use a spindle sander for that? Yeah. Spindle sander would be nice and easy. But that, if you don't have a spindle sander, these are pretty inexpensive. And they do a nice job in a lot of cases. This one went a lot faster because I didn't have that one little extra in cut. But there you go. It's nice and clean. That's, that's good enough 
for me right now, I did sand these sides already. So we'll break all these edges once we get it attached. But let me just show you the method <laughs> for attaching this and getting this going. Now, I'm going to set this board over here for a second. And we're going to bring in the same, the same kind of master square board that we used when we were making our wooden squares. All I did was I had a nice jointed straight edge of MDF here and used that against the fence of my dead-on cross-cut sled. And I made a cut about a quarter inch deep, just a saw cut, and then I fit and glued in a spline of cherry that fit in with no motion. So this set me up to have a, a nice, dead, accurate square beam to this edge. So it's dead on this side and this side. So it's perfect for gluing on and adjusting this. Now, as I went to put this on, I looked at it and I thought, you know, this could be a little improved. This is kind of a hard edge here. I thought this would be a little nicer with a faceted edge. Like if we look at our old one, you check this out. It's round, it's a little rounded over. It almost looks hewn like they did something. This got kind of worn and beat on. This is quarter sawn oak, probably white. Up here you're gonna see more of the original profile where it didn't get worn so much. Right up by the beam <laughs> of the head. And uh, down here it's pretty worn out. So um I wanted to just create a chamfer very simply, nothing fancy. You don't have to uh, set up a, a router or anything. Just set it in your vise and get a little block plane out and have some fun. So I have two block planes usually and my Stanley, my older Stanley model, I usually keep this set pretty heavy so it makes a heavier cut. I'm holding it right at about a 45. It's not critical exactly. So each time I'm getting a nice string coming off there. I mean, look at this kind of like mm. big curly cues. <laughs> you could save those for your Christmas decorating. <laughs> I know. Uh, Martha Stewart would find something to do with those. <laughs> do we have any ideas? <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Dye them. Yeah. So I've got that now. I always keep my little uh, Lee Nielsen set a little fi more finely. So rather than readjusting, I prefer to change block planes. <laughs> and this is the low angle. Is it the 62 and a half it's called? I was, yeah, 60 and a half, pretty sweet. Anyway, that looks good to me. The facet is about as wide as the flat, so I've got about an eighth inch now on the flat, then a facet, and then a narrower. It just looks more refined, doesn't it? Check it out, compared to this edge, nice and hard. You have to hold it still, huh? I'm trying to get it where you can, I don't know, it's hard to see it, right? Without a shadow, there you go. All right, so now we'll hit the other side. Just set it up. I'll do this. It's kind of fun. Now, one thing about the technique here, it's nice if you just skew the plane a little bit. So I'm cutting kind of downward. And you can see when you skew the plane, you resist getting tear out. I, I'd probably be fine going straight. But if you go downhill like that, you're, you also probably get better curly cues. Let's try. <laughs> yeah, see, when you go straight, you just get chaos. <laughs> when you go sideways, you get the curlies. So that's, that's critical to know. <laughs> then we go to the Lee Nielsen. It's like a G 
too hot. Ooh, Easter basket fillings. That's cool. There you go. That'll take a little while to create them all. All right, so that's a good idea. Fire starters. All right, yeah, great. Fire starters, too. So I want to also chamfer the end. This end I already squared. This end's still long. So I could start with this guy. Now, this is going across end grain. So now I'll go to the finer. I want to be real finicky. I'll get that facet, that edge, to hit the corner. See that little? It's all in the details. I'll check that one over there. All right. Getting a little too That'll crazy do. here. Big. That'll do big. <laughs> <laughs> hey, doesn't sound right when you say it. <laughs> what do you say? Good fun. <laughs> All right then. Okay, so we've got the chamfer, chamfer, and now we want to set it on here. There's one final detail before we can put this on. Now, I noticed on this good old square that, can you see that? There's actually that little relief cut there. So I'm going to turn it so I don't know if you can see, but it's, it's very subtle. It's about an eighth inch down and not even a sixteenth inch this way. So that little relief is there to help nothing get trapped in there and always have that clean right up in that joint where the beam meets the blade. So I'm going to make that little relief cut. Now you could go to the table saw and just set a sacrificial fence or, you know, and it's kind of tricky, but to get just one, I actually, I'm going to use an old tool that I haven't gotten much chance to use. I also want to do this on the, the better looking side. Like this has that little funky pattern. I don't know what, it's like a staining in there. Um, in the fibers. This is nice and clean, so I'm going to put the relief cut on this upper side. I've got the grain running up, and I'm going to use this little rabbit plane that I've had, and I don't, I never used it, and I just tuned it up. It's more for show, but it's always been right behind the bench. So you can actually adjust this fence over or back for the width of the cutting blade right there. So I've got it set over so the blade is extended almost that eighth of an inch. And then you adjust this brass stop down and up by turning this knob. And I've got it set, you know, for about not even a sixteenth deep. So if I start over here, I feel like we're on here now. <sighs> Wait, I gotta cut myself. <laughs> I like Roy. Uh, <laughs> Oh, one other thing I didn't mention was this little uh, scoring blade cuts and scores the edge so you don't get tear out. I just, I just didn't hold that in the right spot. I really need Roy here right now. All right, so I'm letting the scoring blade start us off. There, now we're starting to get into the cut. And it doesn't have to be fancy, it just has to be deep enough. This is all pine, right, Tom? Here's yeah, this is hard pine. Yeah. Wow, I'm running off a little there. So I'm going to start back here. I think my scoring blade is a little too far out. And I couldn't adjust that because the screw is torn up. The blade part is also pine except for the maple sides, right? Correct, yep. It's all from the same um, heart pine flooring that I had. Okay, that's good. So see that little relief now? We've got that sweet little relief cut just like our original. It's interesting, that original was probably cut that same way. So we've got that little thing. And now we're going to set it up. So I would put a little glue on here. see. I'll just do it. Why not? We're ready. 
John says, uh, I don't know, this will make sense. Uh, the side used on the paper should also have a chamfer because when you are inking, inking, you need space between the beam and the paper or the ink will smear. Well, John, I, that's a personal preference, I think. I, I always just use pencil and I want that edge to be sharp because that's on the paper in my, I'm using a fine point, usually a five, uh, a point five millimeter and I want that. That's why I want to keep that sharp and crisp. Um, I might just very lightly break it, but um, you're not yeah. going to have an ink issue. No, I'm not going to do ink. So I prefer the pencil for my drawing, so I can erase. And then I, um, I'll just. Uh, whoops, that's not my square end. Phil's asking if that's called a philister plane. Yeah, I believe it is. Phil, did Phil ask? About the philister? <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, yes, I think that's what it is, Phil. Um, I have not. That, you guys just watched the first time I've used that. Probably, <laughs> probably was saying to yourself, this must be the first time you <laughs> 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 um, I do use my shoulder plane a fair amount. And... But a lot, most times when you're cutting rabbits, you're doing it on the table saw. So here's where this nice truing jig works. So that blade stays right on there nicely. I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to center it on the head there. And I'm going to just give it a rub fit, smear that glue around a little bit. And I notice I stayed away from the edges. I don't want it going, I don't want to deal with a lot of squeeze out. Just to show you. Look at that good glue distribution, but I'm not quite to the edge. I'm about not even almost an eighth or less away from the edge. So by the time I squeezed it down, so I'm going to just rub that in and then center it on the head here. And it really helps to have it tack up a little bit. Now I could get the old pin nailer and fire it in there, but it seems a shame to blemish this, right? So I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to, what you, helps is when you get a little tack going on here and it won't slide around. So I don't mind if it's a little offset here because I can plane this flush after. That's pretty close right there. All right, I'm looking sweet against my guide. I feel good and flush against the fence. So now I'm going to bring in a block. This will help get the pressure nice and even over this whole thin piece. And then I can bring in a clamp. So I want to try not to move this much. If it does slide, it's no big deal. I'll just uh, reposition before I fully crank it down. All right, so let's just get that started. The glue can be almost greasy when you start. So yeah, wow. I sure did. It already slid. You may have noticed that. I want to get the block set away a little bit here too. Okay. And reset my blade. There it is, flush. Now I've got a little snuggage on that clamp so I can adjust this without worrying about it sliding around anymore. That's dead on. And if I go to the other side, come over. You got a lot of dead on stuff tonight. Did I say that a lot? A little bit, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's annoying, but true. <laughs> Think of more uplifting phrases, but. What, the dead on or <laughs> annoying? <laughs> well, the word dead is just not fun. Uh, it's deceased on. No, sorry, that's even worse. All right. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> being a little anal about this, but there you go. 
it looks great. Now, you know what? It's not even that critical that this is dead square here um, because I'm going to fit the other end on with it on the parallel other edge. So if this thing isn't dead square, it doesn't matter because I usually just set my paper to be aligned here. And then all your horizontal lines are going to be correct on the paper. So I do, though, like it to be square, <laughs> if it's possible. So that's what we got here. We got a nice that's such fit a there. <laughs> and okay. now we can set this aside. Now, I already have one prepared, as you might guess. And it's already glued up, because we didn't want to wait for that. And it's a nice shape. It's got the little relief cut, all square. So I've got this other board here. And with that on that edge, what I would do, I'm not going to glue this one, because you just saw that. But I do it essentially the same way. I would get this under here and let's see. I'd make a little mark under here. Okay. Make sure my Where are you making that mark? I'm making it under here because see my this blade is too long. So I would take that to the table saw. Um, if it, yeah, this would work on my my crosscut sled, and I would just crosscut to that pencil line, and then I would be um, at the right length. Um, yeah, why don't we just do that right now? I'll just hurry over there. Okay. This would be kind just of a hurry. quick cut. You don't, you don't have to hurry. What do I do with my headphones? Oh, there they are. I can set the pencil line to the curve cut out on this sled. That'll give me get me very accurate. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, come on back and now we're ready to fit our other end. So we want it to slide nicely, but we'll clamp it so it's, it's nice and snug. I mean, we want it to be true and flat. We can always just lightly sand the MDF or the face of this to get it sliding. Now that is dead flush right there. It feels good. And I would go ahead and mark and glue that surface, bring it up. Um, I would put another block in there and then clamp this way. So you can see with just me demonstrating like this why I put that block because this is thin material. So as I push here, I'm going to get all my pressure in the middle. The block is thick enough. It distributes it. So I'll get good full pressure on the full square. But for right now, I just want to show you uh, getting on there. So then this is tracking beautifully. And I would glue that up and let it set. It's three-quarter MDF, is that right? Yeah. And I actually use the regular weight MDF. Um, a lot of times I'll buy the lightweight because it's just so much easier to handle. Um, but this heavier weight is, just feels good for a drawing board. It's a small piece, and it gives you a good, stable feeling to it. So that's what you want for this. So then that would set up. And I want to make this a little bit decorative. So what I did was I, I, would, I would mark it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess I'll do one of them. All right, so I would mark this head here. If you want to come on in. I'm just going to eyeball this. I probably want, I'm going to put some brass pins in here. So I'd want one right about there and over here. But let me just use my finger to mark that location, that location. Then I'll probably want one right about 
here. So I'll do that again. Bring it over here. Now I want that kind of that location there. So I'll come this way. Keeping my my uh, fence set up here. <laughs> my fence is my middle finger. Don't move it. It's so accurate. And then you want to come here. Go pencil line. Pencil line. That's pretty accurate actually for doing this. And then I would take my all and get a little starter point here. Don't try this at home. Why not? <laughs> there we go. Oh, so Lots of years of using that finger mode. <laughs> yeah, if you want to see that again, <laughs> I'm just pinching the, and this is my fence. This finger on the bottom. I can move it. Look it. <laughs> okay. <It's> just, <laughs> It wasn't complicated. I was just saying there's an eye that you have from the distances. Just joking. It takes time. No, it actually is an important technique. Uh -huh. I don't want to skim over this. Okay. All right, so, <laughs> so now I've got that marked out. I'm going to go to the drill press. I'll just drill one hole for now. I just want to show you with one of them. And we'll head over and turn on the light. I've got a 1 8 inch bit in here because I'm going to put in some 8 inch brass pins. That's all I could find um, at the store I was at. And they're fine. So here we go. Pay attention to the diminished noise the here. The healed. Ah, so nice. Thank you, Peter. All right, so here we go. Right in there. Just want to come down. We'll drill one more for now. I don't have much time, so I want to get it. Oh, good. So I haven't, I haven't made it any louder, Peter, since you left. So we'll get that going for us. OK, so what I've, here's the. Here's a little brass that I got. Got it at Home Depot, um, but I'm sure you can get heavier brass, like 3 16 Might look a little nicer, but I realized with that eighth inch uh, brad point bit, it was a little undersized. But if I use this other bit, it's a little larger, and it allowed me to get clearance just reams it out a tiny bit it's funny because that said an eighth inch bit and this is eighth inch but it didn't fit initially let's see how this works yeah so that's good that's fitting nicely if it's too tight you can always just spin it a little more Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can do it out of that for Micah. Yeah, I didn't, I should have qualified that. The one thing I didn't spend a lot of time getting is this base. You can definitely do a nicer base. Uh, but you do want something that's a plywood or an MDF, something that's fairly dimensionally stable. At this dimension, it should stay nice. But you, but if you use solid wood, you may have to worry about the boards kind of moving a little bit. It won't change much over the length. So that's the main thing. But yeah, some kind of whiteboard, like my old uh, drawing board, would be nice. But there's something about the warm tones here. And it's quite hard. And it makes a very nice surface. So I liked it for the weight, inexpensive, and I had it. So that's why I'm using it. So, Sorry, my mic was off for that question. Um, uh, Mr. Mike was asking if, if adding for mica, I mean, si sorry, Rick was asking if adding for mica to the top might be good. Yeah, Mike, you can buy some plywood will come um, 
like a melamine. I'm trying to think. Some comes with a surface, but you could add your own. But um, you can buy special plywood like that as well. So there we go. Check that out. It's um, I've got the holes, and now I'm ready to put in the brass. Now, just a little fun aside here. I I had to cut this brass with the with the hacksaw, and it was thinking about how to hold it and get it accurate each time. All I do, I took a block and I drilled that same hole through it and reamed it out. And then I took a crosscut saw and sawed a kerf so I could use this as a jig. So if I leave an eighth inch hanging out this end, I will get the perfect length. So I was able to just cut them quickly like this and might want to right in front. So I've got the hacksaw. Um, you could measure, but you can kind of see that's an eighth right there. And I'm going to just hacksaw this. And then I could have done it right to the end, and I can just push it right through and get another one. I'm going to eyeball that. That looks good. Cut your pins. Little pin cutter right here. <laughs> Get all pin, all four pins pretty quickly, and uh, and then I just took some wet dry paper. I think this is 800 grit, and I just had to make sure that that one edge was cut. Back. So this brass is pretty soft. You see how fast that was to cut. It's nice to work with. And you can file it quickly. And so I'm not going to do this, but I, what I would do is I just mixed up a little. I wanted something to hold it in there. So I had this little five-minute epoxy. And I picked this up at, um, was it Lowe's? And... It's nice stuff, so I just mix it up. It gives you the equal mix when you squeeze the syringe. You'll get an equal amount, and you just, uh, like let's say I put some on here. You're just going to make sure it's, it's nicely stirred together and evenly mix it up. And then I took this smaller end, and I put a little drop in that hole. And then once that was in there, I was able to take that chamfered end get it started and just press it in until I felt it overhanging. Just see how slight that is on each end? So my jig gives me just enough. And I got all four in there like that. And it's going to squeeze out on the bottom. You can clean up that wet epoxy with denatured alcohol really easily. So I like to get it off the surface. And then um, once it's dry all four and then you do the all four on the other end then you can file them flush and I just take a little metal file and you can it, it goes really fast but because it's so soft you could use a little more aggressive this is pretty fine and as soon as it's flush you can just sand and you'll have a dead flush beautiful brass pin and this little uh, parallel bar starts to get pretty nice looking. And after that, I would come in and I softened all these edges with like uh, 150, 220 grit. And just soften them up, you know, make them feel like an aged piece. And, of course, I need to chamfer this little edge here still. And do that to both ends. And then you're ready for finish. So for this material, I love to use shellac in this case for a couple of reasons. One, it's just it's a super easy to apply. It dries fast. And for this, this, this stuff's really good for this kind of thing. And this is uh, bullseye shellac or comes pre-mixed. <coughs> I won't talk a lot about shellac right now, but... Coming up soon, I will. 
Anyway, you want to thin it out by about a third with denatured alcohol. So take it out, take it, and uh, you know if you have a little jar like this, you'd fill it a little over halfway, and then come in with the fill the rest of the other third. Excuse me, denatured alcohol, and that'll give you what's technically called about a two pound or between a one and a half and a two pound cut. And then, do I have any paper towels? Um, I don't have a brush with me. Hang on a second, I grab a paper towel. <laughs> um, you could brush this on. It's super easy to brush on. <laughs> you just have to, you don't want to keep going back over it though because it does dry very fast. I actually sprayed it. So once I was done sanding everything up, I sprayed the, the piece on one side and then the other side and let it dry for about an hour. Did the same on my board and then hit it again. And I'll show you in a second. It looks basically like this. So it gets really a nice color. It's a lot warmer. And it goes on thin. You can actually wipe it on too like this. But because of how fast drying it is, um, you want to just move right along. Don't try to be too fussy. The nice thing too is once it dries, it sands very nicely. And then when you apply the next coat, it actually melts into the previous coat. But shellac has been around for so long. It's such a sweet finish. And just two coats will give you a beautiful film on there. I just spilled a little on my board. Um, but it'll give you this sweet film. And then the next morning, you can very lightly sand it. I sanded it with like, just to take the dust snips off with 320. <coughs> and then give it a final burnishing with 4 rot steel wool. And after that's dry, and then I also made sure I got plenty on these edges because these tend up to fill. Did the same thing with the shellac and then waxed, put a little wax on after lightly sanding it. And it's just really nice and glides really nicely. You could put a little wax on here too. And I like to break that edge a little more right here. So when I go to fit it down over, it fits quite easily and positions itself to dead horizontal. <coughs> now, um, one, <coughs> one last thing that I wanted on my custom board was to get it to tilt. Like one of the nice features on my Old Faithful was had these little swing out legs and we'd get it to be about two and a half inches. Uh, the legs are like two and a half inches. So the table pitches about three inches from three inches in the back to nothing in the front. So that's a good gauge if you wanted to get yours to tilt the same way. And um, let me move some of this stuff out of the way. Tom, could you hand plane those pins? Flush? Uh, not really. Um, they would ding up your edges. I wouldn't try that. I would just, you can file them very fast. Um, a little larger, wider file, I knocked them off pretty fast. Yeah, I wouldn't, it's not like you get a shaving from the plane. Um, so we have a lot of people that have been drafters and a lot of experience with drafting boards. So there's some good information on the chat about Oh, good. More details and things that you probably well, haven't had to be concerned with. I'm pretty simple about this. Yeah. It's a furniture drawer. Right. <laughs> Sketcher. But it's pretty sweet to have that little board like this in your shop. You don't need a huge drafting table. Um, and then, so you can make your drawings and then set it aside. But like I was just saying, you want to have a little pitch to it. So if I wanted this to be pitched this way, what I did was um, took like a, a block or something, stick it under there, and it would be on a flat surface, and then I could measure 
the height till it's right about three inches. Let me get on this edge here. All right, I'm a little high. So I'll come down. See right there. We got three inches there. Okay, so that's the pitch I want. Now, I would take a block like this. I was just kind of making this up. So I want to set my block. Here's my block that is going to be a foot. So this is going to be a foot under there, but I want to get the proper angle to this. So I'm just going to hold it on the outside. See like this? Yeah, I'm holding it on the outside. I want that to sit in that position, like under here. So I'll make a little mark right about how far it's going to be from this edge. And I'm going to come in here. You're not going to be able to see this line. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to make a line right here. Well, the camera lady is going to get the shot. Not bright enough, though. I didn't think it would. So I just made a line there so you can see that angle. I just, so then I would go to the bandsaw and cut this out. Let's just do that quick, quickly. And uh, I'm going to do, use this one. Okay, I'll, um, I'll just smooth that up really. Just want to smooth that so I can just hit it with the Lee Nielsen here. Tom, what do you use to secure the paper to the board? I just put a little piece of tape on each. But I know I've had drafting dots, those, those little round sticky dots and I actually went through my whole roll. There's a lot of dots on them in a box, so I've never gone to the trouble. <laughs> I should look that up on Amazon, but we'll get uh, you some. I used to go to Staples and just get all the, those supplies. And they're little round dots that don't tear the paper, but I've been using scotch tape lately. But so now check it out. It goes right under there. It fits nicely mm -hmm. and we can take out our support and you can see how it's going to fit right about that position and give me that pitch. So with this I would make a copy on this block. You know I just hold it up there and make a line. It doesn't need to be this thick. This is from stock uh, like cutoffs from the chair making class we had a while back. And I've got that block and then once I made these I was like well those are pretty nice but they look really chunky, so of course I just had to make a little curve here. <laughs> something, like, something like this. That'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Should have never I told you. I think I'm going to be using that one. That'll do, pig. <laughs> that could be used in a lot of ways, but so I would cut this out, and then just to give it a little more decorative foot. And this piece, to hold the pitch, I could put, I could clean that angle and actually use that little cutoff as a flat spot at the front to support my little rubber feet. So I like these things. I use these on the, um, a while back I made a video on making a, um, an end grain cutting board. And you can get these kind of rubber feet on Amazon, a little bag of them. And you just take a screw in the center. Do I have? Yeah. All right. So I don't remember if they came with Phillips screws, but they're just three quarter inch. And what I did was once that's cut out, I'd pop one right there. And then I pop one on that little angle block. And that gives you a nice stability on the table. So you can make that up sort of just that by that method. You're just submitting something to whatever you do to hold that pitch that you like. And then I just put some glue there 
I marked out and I clamped them on there. And when I was done, I got my feet on there. So that is the process. And let me show you my finished board. Stay right there. I'll be right back. My new drawing board. So happy with it. Check it out. I mean, I got to put it this way. I'll put my bench a little. All right, so here's my. Yeah, that scotch tape is going to have to take a <laughs> hike. There's, it a, there's a lot the of people a cringing too. right now. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but check this out. This is just two coats of that shellac that I mentioned. Wow, that's pretty. It feels so silky. That shellac is so nice. I mean, imagine if you tried to oil this. Like if you use an oil varnish, you'd wait 24 hours. Then you put on another coat, another. I literally did this in 12, 12 hours. So it was sprayed really fast. I'll, I'll be talking about that soon. Um, I have talked about spraying, but um, I'll do it again at some time soon. I'll be getting the word out about that. But look at those brass pins. They look nice. That was your idea too, Peter. So, <laughs> man, two credits, two shout outs in one night. So those add a little bit of class on each end. Look how I can soften those edges. We've got the nice chamfer. I plane that flush and then put a little wax on this face. So with the shellac, lightly sand and then wax. Man, these edges as well. What's great about, what I like about this is that I don't need those wires underneath anymore. But because you can just drop it down, you can move it on the paper nicely. Now, if you had tracks or something on the side that it forced this up, it would, sometimes it'll get your paper like that. You'd be trying to always move your paper. Here, you can just drop it down on your paper, and you've got a nice control of it. And it doesn't stay on. But check out the bottom, those nice feet. I ended up using some white stock. I didn't think ahead and use the cutoffs from this. But with the feet on there and those angle blocks, it classes it up a little bit. And when you set it on your bench, it is right where you want it. So I was, you could sit on a stool here and get your work done. And I'm telling you, it feels so different. Come on around here for a second. Look at it from the point of view here. So you see you're using it in this position. Compare it to, whoops, <laughs> this. I mean, compare the store-bought plastic model <laughs> with the wires. These are, this served me well. Sorry. Don't need to. <laughs> you really. It's got a handle. Knocking that thing. It's had its day. It's. But I'm, I'm. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty happy with this because it has a warmth to it. It feels more conducive to great creative moments. You, doesn't it? It does. It's amazing. It's sweet. It's warm. So anyway, that's all I got for did, tonight. Did you shellac the board also, hon? Yes, I did. I sprayed this with the same two coats, and then I lightly sanded, and you... I didn't, uh, I didn't wax this at all, but just lightly sanding with um, 320 grit, it is so silky and smooth. It's beautiful. So with that on there, you get a, a really nice parallel motion. <coughs> I didn't lift it up. So there you go. I wonder if anybody will make themselves a drawing board, but that is the drawing board technique. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, there was one question back when we were talking about the Formica, and uh, Mike asked, what's wrong with too tight? I think you had referenced something was going to be too tight. Um, Do you remember what that was? I Oh, maybe um, when I was talking about sandwiching these on, I want it tight so that these, I want to make sure this, edge and this edge are dead parallel but I 
I actually clamp that up like I did there while it's squeezing tightly to the edges. Um, I wasn't really that worried oh, about it was it was sorry, honey. It was related to the brass pins. He said the brass pins were going to be too tight. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, oh, well, I just read that out. I couldn't the get the brass pins through the initial pilot hole, so um, I just reamed it out a little more. I couldn't even fit it in. So I just wanted to slide it in a little bit. Know I could ease it in with the epoxy, and that's how. So you want to okay. test that okay. to whatever stock you use for your brass pins, and you'll be set to go. So you're going to see this board hopefully for years to come, <laughs> if you decide to hang around in the shop as we go through some creative adventures. Is that it for our questions? That's all I've got, yeah. All okay. right, well, thank you so much once again for hanging out, spending some time with us here in the shop. We couldn't do this without you, and it's been a real joy this year, even amidst all the craziness and the wildness, the it's a settled place to come to the shop and be creative and make something beautiful, a gift you can share or to express some love to somebody in your life. And I hope you'll come on back and see us next week. We'll be right back here on Thursday night for our next edition of Shop Night Live. <laughs> see you then, everybody. Awesome. Thank you.